Okay, everybody, welcome to another episode of the Safe Extreme Podcast. Here on game. Oop, what happened? Uh, don't have your camera. <laughs> there we go. There we go. All right, let's try this again. <laughs> All right, three, two, one. All right, everybody, welcome to another episode of the Safely Extreme Podcast here on Game Wisdom, where we examine the art and science of games. We have another great topic for you this week. As always, I am Josh Blaser and my co-host from Nexus Games, Sharky. How are you doing? Uh, doing, doing better. You know, we, you know, as of, uh, well, you know, long story short, we got a program. <laughs> So, yeah. Right, so, right. today we're going to be tackling a very controversial topic. And something I'm sure you've been thinking about quite a lot. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, forewarning to everybody, you're going to hear a lot of the word of the day today, and that is Neon Continuum. Mm -hmm. My current game. So, uh, starting this, we're going to try and do a little bit of a format change. We're going to try and keep these a little bit more, I guess, brisk. So, uh, no updates or news of the week. We're going to just get right into our main topic. And we're going to try and keep things about 60 minutes, 70 minutes, somewhere around, depending upon how many uh, points we get to. So, if you have any comments about this, let us know in the, of course, in the comments down below. So, we'll see if we can actually keep to that. Again, you know, we don't get on tangents here, right? You're certainly not doing one right now. <laughs> <laughs> so... Ethical monetization is a very big topic. It's something that's going to be discussed in my fifth book that I'm kind of in the planning stages about. But this is something that I think has really come to a head in, we could say, what do you think, like the last four or five years, kind of as we began to see free-to-play mobile games kind of under like a third generation of their design. I mean, it's always been evolving. Mm -hmm. But, you know, usually for the worst. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know, I, I'm not, you know, as familiar with the phases of it. You know, I, 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 I realize the phases when somebody talks about them, but like, mm -hmm. um, the, you know, we want to head towards a ethical place, you know, which is basically the opposite direction that uh, pretty much all the triple A's are heading. Mm-hmm. Which is sad. Yep. And that is kind of one of the major points about this. That when we talk about ethical monetization, that most studios, or at least most of the ones that people recognize don't really prescribe to it and yeah. this is kind of one of the bigger points about this and yeah to a rat's comment about premium currency and things like that there's a lot that goes into what makes something ethical and unethical and that's excuse me one of the challenge of this topic i'm working yeah, on a post oh. uh one key thing that we need to to, to clarify is that when we're talking about ethical monetization, we're not just talking about free to play. Mm -hmm. We're talking about all monetizations. Yep. So that microtransactions, DLC. We're talking about uh, you know uh, gold editions, gold diamond editions, diamond editions, gold mm -hmm. diamond platinum editions, diamond platinum. You know all those you know different things. You know. Yeah, and the reason why we will probably focus a lot on free-to-play is that's kind of where monetization is at its height and mm -hmm. what makes us very tough and this is something i'm writing about right now is that there is no one thing there's no smoking gun that makes something ethical or unethical it all comes down to how it's implemented in a game a loot box system in one game could be ethical while in another game it could be highly unethical and I would disagree with that because, like, unless you're not talking about a monetary loot box, if you're talking about a unmonetary loot box, then yeah, that could be ethical. But you know, I'm talking about a, things more from a mechanic point of view. We're, I'm not even focusing on the monetization just yet. I'm talking yeah. about at the individual system level. 
Yeah, so, at the individual system, mm -hmm. you could do it both ways. Yeah, because like if you're charging for it, that's where you know things get in the question. And mm -hmm. also, there's a big, big, massive difference between a loot box and like say a card pack. You know, mm -hmm. while they may look or, the same on the surface, they are definitely not. Or a gotcha based system as well. Yeah. And again, this is where it gets difficult because just because one developer does things unethical or one does it ethical, doesn't automatically make that design, you know, universally good or bad. Mm -hmm. And it's something that I think a lot of people tend to struggle with. Consumers who will say, oh, there's a microtransaction in your game, you're a pay-to-win scum. Or a developer says, oh, so-and-so did this, well, if we do the same thing, then we're perfectly fine. And that gets at kind of the heart of the idea of, you know, personalization or cosmetics being always ethical, which they are not. Yeah. Usually they, they are the opposite of ethical. Mm -hmm. So the question is, where do we begin? Do we start on the unethical side and work our way to ethical or start ethical and work our way to unethical? What do you think? Maybe we just start with some real world examples and then talk about, you know, why certain things are ethical and why certain things are not ethical in such systems. Okay. So when we talk about monetization in this aspect, as Shark said, we're focusing on kind of the broad scope of it. So if we start at kind of the high level, we have monetization in terms of new content. So DLC, special editions, gold, platinum, diamond, you know, 47 varieties of Ubisoft games, that kind of thing. And when we talk about pure content, as in I hand you money, you hand me a 20 more, 20 more hour campaign or five new story vignettes or things along those lines. If it's a direct transaction like that, that I believe or that I feel is on the fair side. Both parties well, know what they're... <laughs> it depends. Ask a lawyer. Mm -hmm. Because like if, if you're charging $5 for a simple hat, that's, that's not ethical. Well, yeah. I'm not talking about a. I'm talking more on a content point of view. I haven't gone to. Well, I mean, that is a content. That is mm. content. You know, you know. But if you're talking about, uh, you know, a level that lasts five minutes for five dollars, also not ethical. You know, if you're talking about, you know, something that you know gives players, I don't know. Um, Maybe not necessarily a, you know, more total content, just like, 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 say like in like a roguelike kind of thing. If they gave you mm -hmm. a, you know, if they did a DLC and that DLC added in, you know, um, I don't know, 20 more things that provide variants and they charge five, ten dollars for it, that would probably be ethical kind of thing. Mm -hmm. As long as it's adding enough to it. And to Rat's Tail's comment, if they know what they're buying, is it really not ethical? Again, it depends. <laughs> it One of the challenges of kind of ethical and unethical design is how the game is being uh, positioned around it. There are plenty of free-to-play microtransaction-based games that tend to obscure what someone is buying, you know. You're not spending $5, you're spending 3 gems, 4 stars, 75 platinum, and you'll get this rare item. Mm -hmm. And you have to, and this is one of the things I think we're seeing more and more governments take note of, is that purchases cannot be obscured. This is as... Yeah, some, that, is a, that is a government loophole. That's, that's mm -hmm. the reason why pretty much everything is you know, in the video game industry is pretty much unregulated is because of a loophole of the obscured currency because um, basically, you know, the the gambling commission and whatnot only applies to stuff that is actual currency. You know, mm -hmm. if, it's, if it's a obscured, you know, thing, then the rules don't apply, you know. 
Mm -hmm. So that's the reason why to get around, to skirt a lot of these regulations kind of thing, they have, you know, made up where, oh, you're not gambling with, you you know, real money. You're gambling with our currency that you Mm -hmm. bought. And that goes back to the days of prohibition and the idea that, and uh, kind of when we saw this uh, strike against, you know, drinking and gambling, it was, oh, you're not gambling with money. You're just playing a little, you know, little toy game. And then you get a little token and then you can trade that token in for things, you know, like a drink. Mm-hmm. And it's what a lot of, like pachinko parlors in Japan also will do as well. That, yes, you're spending money and you're getting this stuff, but you're not... Uh, training that in for anything but there just so happens to be a uh, reward uh, kiosk you know five feet away from the pachinko parlor you can trade that in for real money but you're not doing it on site you know it's a completely different service Mm -hmm. and like we said when you're trying to gauge whether something is ethical or not it really has to be decided as early in the game's development as possible. Because when we talk about monetization, whether it's the high level of new content or low level microtransactions, this is something that becomes integral to your game design, your game experience. You're, you're not supposed, you shouldn't be waiting until your game is done to then figure, okay, should we put microtransactions in? No, you need to be thinking about this concurrently as you're designing your game. Yeah, because when when you wait till the last minute, not only is it, it it's like I don't know what would be the right expression. Uh, it, it's like if 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 you were growing up, kind of thing, and uh, the entire time you grew up, kind of thing, you didn't have arms. And then all of a sudden, you know, on your 18th birthday, all of a sudden you get full grown arms kind of thing. It is like, uh, what? (laughs) And it doesn't make any sense. And it doesn't fit. You know, you've lived your entire life without arms. So you're like, uh, what? Or maybe even the inverse of that, where you lose your arms at 18. (laughs) You know, you know, it it just doesn't make sense. It feels tacked on. It, it, It feels bad. The only the only monetization that makes any kind of sense to decide at the very end is just we're going to sell it for a flat price. That's that's the only only monetization model that makes sense to tack it on at the end. And again, that is considered at least in most cases to be ethical because it is a flat transaction. I give you twenty dollars, you give me a game, you know. We're done, we never have to see each other ever again, kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But one of the big things that's happened in the last five to ten years has been this growth of live service, where it's not done after you spend fifty, sixty dollars. There's a season pass, there's the special edition, there's new content. Or, as we saw with a lot of developers really trying to, I guess, like double or triple dip, have microtransactions on top of a retail game. And we're not talking about microtransactions as in, you know, a new costume or a new level. We're talking about selling, you know, experience boosts. Oh, you need more gold for your game? Well, give us 50 cents and we'll give you a thousand gold. How can you not like that? Yeah, the, you know, and then they would purpose, you know, a lot of developers purposely created a problem in order to sell you the solution. And uh, that is clearly unethical. (laughs) And that goes into the concept of fun pain. The idea that you're purposely making a game worse in order to sell the solution or sell the cure for it, which, excuse me, can only be acquired with real money. Yeah. And we, we've, we've seen some of that in, in non-monetized ways, too. Mm-hmm. Like, we see that in... Um, you know, sadly, a bad example of that is is in uh, the uh, what is the Evil Genius, mm-hmm. Evil Genius Two, where you have to progress all the way up through the tech tree to get to the point where your cameras will automatically love, uh, you know, mm-hmm. mark enemies that come into your base, kind of thing. Mm-hmm. It's like that. That should have been a base level stuff the second you unlock the cameras. 
You know, yeah. what's the point of the cameras if they don't sit there and, you know, mm-hmm. assign stuff and you have to go and manually go every time somebody comes in there? That's a problem they created and they sold the solution, but they sold it in game with in game currency. There's no microtransactions. But when you have that, when you sell that through, you know, a microtransaction, you know, it's it's the same thing. It's it's but it's bad monetization at that point rather than just bad design. Mm-hmm. And that is an example where you can see kind of the gears working in the background. You can see kind of behind the current as to why that decision was made. That you can take that system and apply it to any monetized game. Like, I'm sure someone could be doing the very exact same thing, but charge 50 cents or a dollar. You know, camera, super camera upgrade, you know, 99 cents. Have your cameras automatically track enemies for you. Or, or charge, you know, be like, you can, you can buy uh, this package for, you know, and get 500 identifications for five, $5, you know, and then you, you have to keep on renewing it. Mm-hmm. And that, again, is one of the common points about this, is that for people like us and, you know, someone like, uh, we get Ramin on again, like, we see this stuff immediately. And part of the challenge about this is trying to educate people on what's good and bad. Because like I said at the start, there are people who will say, oh, if it's cosmetic, then it's automatically good. Or, oh, if it's only a dollar, you know, then, you know, what's the harm in doing it? Just as there are people... I I wonder who started that whole thing about, uh, you know, if it's cosmetic, it's good. Maybe it's the the triple A's who have abused everybody for oh, so yes. long that that you know surprise you mechanics. know looks look looked in there and be like you know the cosmetics is our most you know valuable thing and it's the most abusive thing that we're getting over the most on is making mm-hmm. the most money. Why don't we promote that as being you know um, good and we'll do it's just cosmetics. It's a catchy mm-hmm. line, you know, just like the politic line, you know, mm-hmm. you know, you know, it's just cosmetics. It's yeah. just cosmetics. And and then they drilled that into so many people's heads that that, you know, just, you know, you know, vomited it back verbatim kind of thing. And now it's, you know, just all over the place. And it's even got developers in on it that, mm-hmm. you know, had no intention on being bad, you know, had intention on being good. And then they're just like, it's just cosmetics. And and it's like this infection mm-hmm. caused by the triple A's that have, you know, infected us with this it's just cosmetics. They tried to do the surprise mechanics too, but that didn't go over well with them. But they, <laughs> they did well with the, you know, with the it's just cosmetics. And it's the same exact thing. There is no difference between the surprise mechanics and the it's just cosmetics. You know, that is the exact same thing, but one of them, they got over people, and the other one got caught. Mm-hmm. And there are people who argue with me that, oh, it's fine. You know, we can just... It's just like a playing Diablo. You know, loot boxes are perfectly ethical. And somebody tried to play the, oh, but what about this game with me, with trying to argue that Diablo is just like a mobile game. Which, again, not count the Diablo mobile game, which is its own quandary. You got a phone, don't you? Mm Mm-hmm. And part of this problem, again, is that when you're trying to find whether or not something is ethical, you have to be able to understand what aspects make it ethical and what makes it unethical. Mm -hmm. So if we talk about things from the unethical side... Somebody should not feel like they need to be forced to spend money. And this is a major point that I talk about in my article and in the upcoming book. That a lot of the mobile and very monetized games will kind of force it down your throats to say, Oh, you need to buy this. Oh, why haven't you bought this? You need this. Or they'll do it very uh, covertly 
and they'll just make the game very hard for you. Oh, you had progress? Well, now you're going against people that are 80 times harder than you, but you can always spend money and maybe get a powerful new weapon. Yeah, and one thing we need to put out here, there is no game that is, you know, um, 100% ethical that have basically ever seceded. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're not telling you to be 100% ethical. We're telling you to be a majority, a vast majority ethical, because, like, there are unethical stuff that if you do not do it today, you are dead, you know, as a studio. Like, mm -hmm. if, you list your, if, if you list your price for sale at $14.99, the fact is, is that price is unethical because that is tricking the people that it's not $15 when it actually is $15. You know, if you listed your price at fifteen dollars rather than fourteen ninety nine, your sales would probably half, if not lower. You know, because of that one cent, and it's a psychological trick. But you know, it it's it's very very minor in that fact, and it's a must do these days. Mm -hmm. So you know, yeah, it's sort of an ethical gray area, but it's still bad. You know, but at this point, there is no choice. It is widespread through culture, and it's 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 uh you know, it, it's ingrained in us. So like you know, there there's no escaping it at this point. <laughs> and that or key key probably key word in that is probably as originally. <laughs> Yeah, this was really it. And part of this issue is that because everything can be exploited, it makes it very hard to kind of prove when something isn't exploited. And one of the reasons why people still will trust companies like Nintendo and Valve and, you know, the whole consumer loyalty is that they can get away with a lot of their stuff by focusing on making a... Their games are often very ethical. Their price at a, you know, quote-unquote fair price. But, you know, the, Nintendo has done some very skeevy things in the past, especially when it comes to, you know, emulators and, you know, mod support and kind of the fandom on that side. But they get away with that because their products are very much, you know... As straight lace, I think, as one can be. At least until they started doing more mobile stuff. But that's another story. Yeah. And to Will's point, yeah, there's tons of, you know, streamers and YouTubers that do that. Like, you know, like, I, I, I know I watch one. And, you know, almost every video, every other video, they come on and be like, Hey, we just got new limited time merch. It's only available for until it's sold out. You know, get it now. Kind of thing. <laughs> And, uh, you know, you know, and once it's gone, it's gone. And the thing is, is what they're probably doing is pre-orders kind of thing. And once, you know, once they're ready to cut off that faucet, you know, they cut it off and then just never, you know, get any more kind of thing. So they just do one bulk order kind of thing. And they use the fear of missing out to trigger that kind of thing. And, you know, that's been done in games. You know, Nintendo's done that several times recently. Yeah. You know. Or, or people who expect and they say, "Oh, well, we haven't got any donations." You know, oh, you got to donate. You know, you know, if you don't, you know, something bad will happen to me, or they'll manipulate people along those lines. Yeah, and uh, bring this back to game design or video games in general. That if you cannot convince somebody to spend money on your game ethically then you are kind of have one foot in the unethical grave already. And it can be very difficult because we've seen games that kind of skirt this line. As Shark said, there is no such thing as, you know, unethical, ethical, and never the two shall meet. It's always, like, different degrees. Yeah, and... And what we're talking about is like, you know, 
you know, Josh said you got one foot in your grave if you're not being ethical. And I would say you got one foot in the grave if you're being, you know, less than 80% ethical, you know, mm -hmm. like, you know, even 90% probably, you know, you need to be mostly ethical, you know, like again, the 99 cent thing at the end, that's unethical, but that is, you know, just a very, very small thing that, mm -hmm. you know, people won't even register as being unethical, even though it is, but you know, mm -hmm. you, you have to do that kind of thing now, you know, and, you know, as, as YouTubers and whatnot, we have to tell you to subscribe and lick the smash button at the end kind of thing. And, you know, that's mm. something we have to do. But you know, still unethical. Else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but those are small things. And, you know, that are, we're, you know, it's a very, very small percentage. So, like, we're keeping, like, 99 99.9% .9 ethical kind of thing, and like 0.01% unethical kind of thing. And, you know, you need to keep that, you know, high level of uh, of ethicalness, you know, but you will never reach 100% unless you want to basically fail. Mm hmm And the more you t try to be ethical the more challenging that you're trying to reach on that like we said you need to do this early because once you start kind of going down this route or you wait too long to do it it becomes harder and harder to implement this fairly as we saw the law of triple a games that will then tack on monetizations at the very end or you know they'll wait until the game is about release and they'll say oh and if you want to get extra loot or extra bonuses give us 5.99 yeah and and the oscar's comment it was actually josh that started that <laughs> oh it's definitely degrees of free to play and the issue that we see with a lot of titles that go this route is that they may do one thing good but they may do two or three things unethically so mm -hmm. here's an example from uh, the mobile game Azure Lane. This is a title that I think has perhaps the fairest... <laughs> oh, there we go. Uh, this is a title that has the, I think, one of the fairest uh, gotcha banners in terms of giving the player currency. It's the only one that I play where you can guarantee, just through playing, get enough for a 10 roll once a week. Maybe even more than that, depending on playing any, any special events. But then what they do, though is that they heavily charge on any kind of custom skins for their characters. Also, don't Google those skins or you'll probably get put on a watch list, for sure, with that game. Yeah. But those skins can run anywhere from like 10 to $20, I think. I, I haven't really done the uh, conversion of the currency. But that currency is like, oh, you play the game for a month, you'll get five. Oh, and it costs like a thousand to get a skin of a character and many skins are you know limited time only and what they do of course is that that's where their monetization model is focused on and you'll see this with a lot of these games that there has to be a central point of their monetization system you know what are we banking on people spending money on is it custom skins is it quality of life you know cutting down fun pain is it new content you know new banners new characters stuff like that and that's where these games will tend to prioritize in the title illusion connect their kind of primary monetization is going to be the gotcha system that almost every i think like two to three weeks now there's a new character banner sometimes there's three or four character banners and their drop rate is i think two percent to get one of those characters when you're rolling the gotcha so for them that's where they're primarily focusing on their money but again every game is different yeah and something i want to loop back and talk about is the the different um oh what was i going to say <laughs> uh... 
Mm-hmm. I hate when I load it. All right, let's go on. <laughs> okay. Let's see. Yep, and to Will's comment, once somebody, excuse me, once somebody starts to see the issues going on behind the scenes, it colors their entire thoughts on that game. You know, oh, I'm having trouble here. Well, it must be because of a pay to win option. And this is why, as we said, once you start going down this road, it's very hard to course correct. Right. Um, and then I want to go back to talk about the, the, uh, obscured monetization, mm-hmm. you know, um, basically that is one of the things that is basically always unethical, mm-hmm. you know, it, it's, it's only there to skirt loopholes in the wall, but here's the thing. If you do not research a law and you do not know exactly what's legal and illegal if you if you get rid of that paid currency Mm -hmm. and you just straight off come in with currency you might be in for a world of hurt you probably you are likely to be in for a world of hurt because the fact is is Mm -hmm. most things done in a free play game kind of thing are illegal if you don't have that buffer free uh, that buffer paid currency in between Mm-hmm. And, you know, because all those things are very, a lot of those things are very, very, very unethical. So unethical, they're, they're against the law, which mm-hmm. would be loot boxes, you know, your, mm-hmm. your normal loot box. And, you know, maybe we should talk about the difference between a loot box and, and a card pack and maybe gotcha. Even, gotcha's kind of in the center of those two. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so when we talk about loot boxes, the issues with with them is that you are spending money on a completely unknown commodity. It can be, and this is why people like them or why developers like them, it is the most akin to a slot machine. I pull the lever, I could get something that's worth $5,000, I could get something that's worth three cents and what they do is that there is no kind of control or manipulation to kind of help the consumer it is just basically a money drain it may be there may be a control or you know thing in there to go against the consumer Mm -hmm. you know like a rigged casino machine because i Mm -hmm. mean there are plenty of games out there that have basically a rigged casino in in their thing you know um you know and you know i don't know this for sure but i'm pretty sure raid shadow legends have that Mm -hmm. i'm you know pretty sure hearthstone has that and i'm pretty sure there's a lot of other triple a's that have that you know not not a whole lot of them but probably and this is another very big point a lot of these systems are never told to the consumer and mm-hmm. that is five thousand percent unethical and i think could be is that legal in some places mm, I, I don't think every i think a lot of people do have laws against that mm-hmm. but i think i know they have laws about it when it's not being obscured by the currency mm-hmm. but I'm unsure if they have laws about it when it's not obscured by the currency. That that currency really obscures a lot of stuff, you know. Yeah, and I think this will be something that will become part of the growing discussions. You see, for those of you who forget, you know, before the world got shut off in 2020, there was a lot of discussions about having laws regarding monetization and loot boxes. Not just in the United States, but all around the world. And now that things are starting to reopen, I'm sure some of these discussions are going to start coming back. Yeah. And, you know, the the whole core behind a loot box is there is no set value. Mm-hmm. Meaning that it is gambling. Yep. And this goes back to what we were saying earlier, that part of the reasons why the game industry has gone away with, gone away with this for so long 
has been the very fact that we're not, quote unquote, dealing with real money. You're not spending money on, you know, skins or music or a new character. You're spending gems and stars and, you know, platinum and unobtainium and uh, free to play play you know. <laughs> yeah and 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 you're you're just doing simulated gaming gambling inside with those currencies that you paid real money for and don't forget this point you can't take that money out because that's another point about gambling is that part of it is that yes i'm gambling i'm getting chips and you know currency points or whatever but then i can trade that in for real money and that's when we get into the whole game uh, gambling commission. Mm -hmm. But with video games, outside of very specific examples like Eve Online and uh, Second Life, and I'm sure there are a few others, they don't allow for currency exchange. Yeah. So, in other words, it's worse than the worst casino that you've ever been to. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, like you, you think about it, it's number one a casino first, and mm -hmm. then you know they can, you know, put systems in there to you know rig the machines to not pay out, aka a rig casino machine. Mm -hmm. And then when they pay out, you get the the tokens and everything, and they're like, yeah, we we are cashing you out. We're not going to give you cash for that. So it's mm -hmm. it's a it's a rigged casino. That you can't even cash out of. So everything you put in there, every every cent that you go into a casino in with, you do not leave without it. With it, rather. Mm -hmm. So you know, you know, you're better off going to a casino and playing in there because you can cash out. And maybe you know, there's a lot of laws and a lot of monitoring that uh, maybe you won't actually. Mm -hmm. get get uh you know scammed by a rigged machine there yeah but and, you know they're like triple getting you there mm -hmm. you know, and, most of the things and to go to his point that was another major thing that happened kind of around the rise of the mmo genre the idea of having black market you know gold farmers being a very lucrative uh field it got so lucrative that blizzard just decided oh let's just sell gold in our game now yeah, it doesn't cost us anything, and we can make a shit ton of money off of it. Mm-hmm. And they fought against that for years, too. <laughs> Was that, like, right around the time that they got bought by Activision? I don't know. <laughs> they were spreading a rumor right there. <laughs> but, but there's, you know, let's let's go to the other stream, the, the card packs. Mm -hmm. Now, when I say card packs, I don't necessarily mean, you know, things you buy in CCGs. Because, you know, you probably will buy them in a CCG, but not all CCGs have card packs kind of thing. Like, let's look at Hearthstone, for example. They don't have card packs. They have loot boxes. Mm -hmm. But when you have, uh, when you look at, like, say, Magic the Gathering, they have card packs. Mm -hmm. Now then, what what really defines a card pack to be different than a loot box mm -hmm. is inside of a card pack, you know, and this goes for physical Magic the Gathering as well as, you know, the, the video game of Magic the Gathering, the mm -hmm. online ones. Well, no, they're, they're not the OG loot boxes. They're, they're not loot boxes at all. They're card packs. They're very, very different. Very, very different. Mm -hmm. They have similarities. But, you know, I mean, you know, a game that you're selling for $19.99 has similarities with a game that ha that's selling for $59.99, has a gold edition for, you know, $79.99, has a you know, platinum edition for $89.99, has a super gold for, for $200, has a super platinum for $5,000, and, and, and it goes on and on. Those two are similar, but they are very, very, very different. You know, there, there's an ethicalness in, in the difference kind of thing. And it's a pretty major one. So here, here's the difference. See, in, in a, you know, a loot box, when you buy a loot box, you get a random thing of a random value. 
There, mm -hmm. there is nothing set. And that is something the gambling commission will absolutely hmm. eat your soul for. Mm -hmm. Where, you know, the physical magic of the gathering and Yu-Gi-Oh! and all these other card games, all those have to go to the gambling commission because they're they're exchanging for real money. They don't have that opposite up they don't have the 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 uh, paid currency to obfuscate the the transaction. So you know what happens is is the when you buy a pack of cards, you know a card pack. What happens is you get set mm -hmm. values. You know you know when it you know is listed on the pack somewhere that you are going to get. You know, let's say. Um, 10, 10, uh, let, let's say seven uh, commons, mm -hmm. three uncommons. You're going to get one rare and you're going to get one full card of any rarity. And it can be, it has, um, this much of a percentage chance of being an extra rare mm -hmm. kind of thing. And when it's done that way, when a consumer goes in and buys it, they have a set value that they're going to get. They know that they're, they're, the set value is seven un, seven commons, three uncommons, one rare, and one foil mm -hmm. of, of various rarities. And because a foil is a rarity, you know, it's a rarity above rarities kind of mm -hmm. thing. So, like, there that is a set value. So that whenever you buy the the thing... It's not about ratios. It's about set values, not ratios. Mm -hmm. Ratios and 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 set values are different, very different. Mm -hmm. Because the the value of the item is very very relevant. Because the gambling commission says that if you do not, I, I forget how they phrase it, but basically they say consumers have to be buying something of a set value because otherwise you're getting ripped off potentially. Mm -hmm. If it does not have a set value, then it's, well, go to the Gambling Commission. Mm -hmm. Because the Gambling Commission is what's telling you this. And the Gambling Commission says that things have to have a set value and consumers have to know what value they're getting. Mm -hmm. It's just like back in the old day when you go to a gumball machine. You know, you remember those? Mm -hmm. <laughs> when you go to the gumball machine, they will have like, 20 different colors of gumballs in that machine. Mm -hmm. And you will t put a quarter in there and you will turn it and not know which gumball you're going to get. But there is a set value. It's a set value of a gumball. Mm -hmm. You don't know if it's going to be a red gumball. You don't know if it's going to be a green gumball. You don't know if it's mm -hmm. going to be a white one. But there mm -hmm. is a set value of a gumball. Now, if they had put stuff in there like you can you can go in there and you know get a little capsule that has air in it then you're not getting a set value and that and, would be illegal to the gambling commission and that's another point about loot boxes or the kind of ideal loot box is that you can spend money and get negative value mm -hmm. if you get something that you cannot use at all or it's so minimal and it's used that it's not even worth, you know, it's not even worth it to try and mill it or sell it. That is very unethical. It's one of the things that we've talked about with the discussion over whether or not to have a fixed limit on how much somebody can spend. And that kind of is, a, I think, a good segue into uh, gotcha-based systems or banners well, along those lines. Before we get into that, I want to address what Rats talked about mm -hmm. cards do have a set value because the set value is based off of how many are produced and mm -hmm. the rarity of them. So when you produce them at an even amount, then all rare, you know, are the same value. Mm -hmm. Now then there is a secondary value that gets applied after that. And that is called consumer value. And if mm -hmm. and that is based off of supply and demand, and that is not something based off of the game. That is something based off of what consumers do. If if mm -hmm. consumers say 
they do not like this rare and they do not want it. They are not willing to buy more of it and they just want to get rid of it. Then to them, that rare has less value. And, and if, if everybody really has, wants this one rare and like they, they all want to buy all of it and nobody wants to sell it, then they're like, okay, that is a super valuable rare. So they will, you know, get be willing to get rid of that one rare for free or like one cent kind of thing. And they'll be wanting to get that other one for like hundreds of top, maybe even thousands of dollars kind of thing. <laughs> and they wouldn't be willing to sell it for any less kind of thing. Or, you know, and, and that, well, the secondary market has nothing to do with the game itself that is that is something that comes with all items you buy a car you buy a brand new car for thirty thousand dollars you you try to sell it and you're only going to get half the price you know mm -hmm. because of the 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 secondary market you the 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 person who is making the product has no control over the secondary market mm -hmm. that is not a concern for game development or for anything else as long as you're creating ethically mm -hmm. viable stuff to begin with and you know like i mean you you know there are ferraris that get sold for you know a million dollars and you know you know at three days later mm -hmm. those ferraris are you know being resold by scalpers basically for millions and millions of dollars like 10 million you know there are graphic cards out there that are being sold for 500 dollars right now that people you know get bots and they go get them and then they sell them on the secondary market for two thousand dollars now is that nvidia's fault probably not is it amd's fault probably not but we are getting but, off track and we are trying to keep this under an hour four days is the secondary market that value is not not a value that is anything to do with selling the product as long as you're selling the product ethically mm -hmm. and to talk about how all things aren't create equal or trying to get that value that takes us into kind of the idea of a banner system and banners are a little depending upon how they're implemented can be fairer than a loot box what they do <laughs> What they do is they say that you, if you give us money for this banner, we guarantee that you are going to get a character. Now, what that character is, you know, is besides the point just yet. But, you know, if this was done in a loot box, it would basically be, okay, we're going to put everything from plus five, you know, pennies to ultra, ultra rare character. And everything's going to be put into this loot box. And there is no... <coughs> there is no consistency. There is no kind of standard. Like we said earlier with the gumball machine. You put 25 cents in, you are guaranteed a gumball. Do you know exactly what gumball you're going to get? No. But you are guaranteed a product. Of a set value. Mm-hmm. Now, what they do with the gotchas, of course, is as you keep putting money in or as you keep going up, you're going to have a greater chance of getting those lower drop characters simply by doing 10 pools. And what they'll do to incentivize that more is say that, you know, if you don't, if you do a 10 pool, you're guaranteed a two star character. And a lot of these games are just kind of built on you always pulling in 10 pools because of it. Now, Here's the question about this, and this is where, again, we get this idea of, like, shades of ethical free-to-play. The games that have stupidly low drop rates, I'm talking less than a percent to get an ultra-rare, a five-star, a six-star, or anything along those lines, given, like, this kind of system as we're talking about, do you think low drop rates are parts of ethical or unethical design like do you think there is a good example of having a very low drop rate something like genshin impact for instance i mean if they if they do it 
in an ethical way. You know, like like a like a it CCG depends. would by <laughs> dividing up into rarities and then keeping the rarities as the same, but then guaranteeing the rarities at you know you know in ways. You know. Mm-hmm. Um, and to Russ tell point, you know, you can't, you can't really plan for the secondary market. Mm-hmm. That's, that's, that's basically telling, you know, like planning for a secondary market is like planning for the success of your Kickstarter before you've started making the Kickstarter, you know, that, mm-hmm. that, that can't happen. You, 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 you cannot fathom what is not even remotely there. And this is why I think a lot of uh, TCG developers have really embraced CCG games because when you're doing something digitally, there is no secondary market because there's no ability to trade that good. Mm-hmm. Unless, of course, you build it directly in the system like what you're doing in the Neon Continuum. But for yeah. most CCGs, you know, when I get that card, that is locked to my account. I can't just say, okay, I'm going to take this card, you know, buy it for me for $10, and, you know, we go from there. Yeah. Hearthstone has a similar system, but it's it's very different at the same time, to where you can take your cards and, and you're selling them, but you're selling them for these different currencies. That's the milling. And, and by scrapping them, quote mm-hmm. unquote. And then you get those different currencies, and then you buy cards with those different currencies. So, I mean, you are doing that technically in Hearthstone, too. But, you know, and it's phrased differently, you know, whether it is, is being obfuscated by more currencies kind of thing. And when in the Continuum, mm-hmm. when I do it in there, I'm not obfuscating it because I'm taking it. When, when you sell it, it turns back into the free currency. When yeah. you, you, you know, buy something from there... You buy it with more free with free currency, yeah. and, and you earn free currency in game as well as you can buy more of it. You know. Mm-hmm. And to Rat's Tales comment, that's another really important point because it really is going to depend on how your economy is set up for this. Like I said earlier, like something that has a ten pool system can be considered fair, but how easy. Is it for somebody to be able to make use of this? With a game like Illusion Connect, for instance, or like I said with Azure Lane, just by playing the game, I can guarantee a 10 pool very easily. Now, are the drop rates really high in that? Hell no. But as a free player, I can at least participate in that. Now, conversely, you have something like a Princess Connect and I think it was Arknights, that in those games, getting enough resources for a 10 pool is like pulling teeth. It is very hard, outside of, of course, spending money, to be able to do that. And again, this goes back to what we said at the start, that these systems aren't binary. They're not immediately good or immediately evil. It's how everything is built into them and how they're balanced that determines where they fall on the scale. Yeah, which all of that goes into a completely different topic about economics and not ethical. Yeah. But they do kind of interconnect in this aspect. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, the developer needs to be making money. This is something that we've said time and time again. A completely free-to-play game that needs no monetization, that you never have to spend one cent on, it's probably going to be a dead game within a month, maybe less than that. Mm-hmm. Because so, there will never be any updates. Mm-hmm. At least, you know, at least as long as the developer isn't working for free. Mm-hmm. Well, what should we use, then? Should we say... I don't know. Do we say fair and unfair? What do you think, Shark? I don't know. I, I it, it is all ethics, though. You know, mm-hmm. it's and, just there. There are many ways to think about it. You know, mm-hmm. and 
what you need to, I think ultimately one of the things you need to figure out, and I think this kind of will set the stage for like kind of moving into the uh, back part or kind of the conclusion for discussion for today. How fair is your game to a free player? As in, as somebody who either doesn't spend any money or maybe spends very light. We're talking, you know, if we're talking about, you know, the whole fish analogy from free to play games, you know, can a guppy compete with a whale? And for a lot of games, no, you can't do that. And then Not again, unless you're just a master level player. Eh, I would argue no. Like, and even can, then, you're you're not going to be at the top. Yeah, you like, can be if you're a master level player and they're just you know welling you know and they're they're okay or decent, you can you can get up there next to the near them, but you can't yeah. you can't you can't top them kind of thing. And this is they why... can outspend whatever strategy you can make. Yeah, like with like with another one, I'm playing a uh, Princess Connect. I can build the best damn team, the most, you know, perfectly uh, composition, everything is synergized and perfectly. But if somebody else has a team of five star, you know, fully ranked characters, I am going to get demolished like nobody's business. And I, I, I have to disagree with that because I don't believe you can build that team because you fail to get good. <laughs> but... <laughs> Yeah, if somebody has something clearly better and stronger than yours, then yeah, you you stand no chance. Yeah, and again, there are so many subtleties to this that we could spend. You know, we get wrong meaning, and we'll hear we'll be here for another ten hours. You know, between the three of us, coming up with these examples, like, yeah. and this one is thing I want to tackle though mm -hmm. is is why should you do one monetization over another? Mm -hmm. Let's let's look at free to play. Why would you be free to play? Well, you would be free to play because it is a multiplayer game that you need to get player and it's a multiplayer only game because you need to get a lot of people in to have the game work. Mm -hmm. And in a case like that, you you need it to be free to play because you're you're an unknown developer, so nobody knows you. Nobody knows your game. You mm -hmm. know, you put a price tag on it, and far far less people are going to want to take a shot on that. And when they, and you don't have a massive marketing budget, and then mm -hmm. when you go to sell it, kind of thing, you get you know maybe you know let's say you sell a hundred copies in the first you know, mm -hmm. uh week kind of thing well you know those 100 copies will be refunded before that week will be over because they're not able to match make with anybody mm -hmm. so they don't even get to play their the game they just bought so that is like a no-go so free to play will be like it gets rid of that barrier of entry of 15 dollars or whatever price tag you were going to sell it for mm -hmm. and it makes it where anybody who wants to play it can just click a download button, download it, and get right into it. And that will open you up to far, far higher player numbers, which will then allow you to get, hopefully, enough players to actually match make, which then will allow you to actually play. Yeah. Now, if you're doing a single-player experience, you don't want to do free-to-play. Mm -hmm. You do not want to do free-to-play. And maybe not all multiplayer things do you want to do free to play? But you know, that is a specific example of like my case with Neon Continuum of why I wanted to do, do um free to play. Well, I didn't want to do free to play, but it was a must do in order for the game to have any inkling of success. Yeah. And that is something you have to figure out while you're developing the game yeah. to why you're going with that model. Don't just go with free to play because you're going to go with free to play. Don't go just with paid because you're going to go with paid. Have a reason behind it. And that's a direction. We... That's the reason why it can't be just tacked on at the end. Yep, just what I was about to say. And 
to Rat's comment about premium currency. Premium currency, again, would fall more in the economy of these kinds of games. I think that would be kind of off topic, I think. For as well time. as the unethical. Yeah. Too. And you know, it depends. Again, if somebody can earn premium currency, and I mean earn it at a decent rate, then I would say it's on the okay side. Again, games like Illusion Connect, Azure Lane, and so on, they do allow you to earn premium currency very readily. But again, how much do you actually spend on that? For instance, if I earn 500 rubies a week, but it costs me 2,000 rubies to do a 10 pull, well, that's a bit of a problem. I would say in general it's un it's it's unethical because here's the thing is you don't have to have that special currency. Mm -hmm. You can just have a regular currency and have everything happen the same exact way. You know, that's the way I'm doing it in the end continuum. You know, it's not like you know, like there's a free currency of gold or whatever we call it, mm -hmm. and then there's the you know, paid currency of diamonds or whatever that we don't have kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And you know, if, if a player is going to be able to earn it, just let them earn it kind of thing, you know? And, you know, that's the way we have it in Neon Continuum, where you earn the free currency kind of thing, but you can also buy more of it, you know? There's, there's not a reason to separate purchases if you're going to also allow them to earn it. Mm -hmm. You know, just let them earn it and purchases and just have one in-game currency. Mm -hmm. No obfuscating. You know, it's when obfuscation comes in when trouble really begins. Yeah, and I think I just rhymed there. Too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and when you're trying to make these systems fair for people, again, it really has to be built on what do you expect somebody to reasonably be able to play your game with? And specifically play it at a free level. Because the free level is going to be your baseline. If I can play your game and compete without spending one cent, and I can do it in a relatively you know brisk period, that is on the good side. But a lot of these games will tend to either delay that or they'll start that downward scale or that downward spiral. You know, it's like, okay, I can do really well, but as I start to level up, it becomes harder. And now I'm being matched with higher level people. And now everyone has the best characters and I don't. And what is somebody supposed to do? Now, again, people will argue that, and I guess here's a point, and I think this may be one of my final ones, so I want to ask you this as well as the audience watching. Do you think that it's fair in a free-to-play game to kind of, I don't want to say demand, but put in place that somebody should eventually have to spend money on this game. As in, well, if you're going to play this for 40 hours, I expect, you know, you should at least be able to spend, you know, $30 at some point just to get these advantages, you know, to compete. No. No, that is unethical. Mm -hmm. Because the fact is, is you have to realize that part of your consumer base are people that either have no money because they're, you know, five-year-olds, 10-year-olds, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And some of them are, you know, people who live in foreign currency, for, foreign countries where mm -hmm. their currency conversions to ours is, is basically, yeah, do you have a million dollars? No. Well, if you did, you could exchange that for one U.S. dollar, and you could buy this ninety-nine cent, you know, microtransaction. You know, it's like uh, I don't, I, I'm not rich. You know, I'm not one of the you know top five richest people in my country, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So I can't afford a dollar microtransaction inside of a game. You know, and that's a bit of extreme, but you know, I'm just doing that to get a point across that you know. There mm -hmm. are countries out there that the conversion rates, yeah, they they can never ever afford something. So if you're requiring it, kind of thing, mm -hmm. then your game isn't free to pay, play. Yeah, your game is is 
free to start. Exactly. Not free to play. You know, as a free to play model, they should be able to play the entire thing. Yeah. Entire thing. Without now, without paying anything for free. Mm-hmm. Now, that doesn't mean they have to have access to all the content, mm-hmm. but they have to to you know be able to play the entire thing. You know. Yeah. Now you again, know. though, that gets into the issue when we start talking about additional content and support. How important is it for you to get that new expansion or you know that new booster pack? And this is again where it gets very tricky. Because, as we know, with a CCG, or any kind of deck building system, new cards means new tactics. It means a new meta. It's akin mm. to... Now, not even in this case. I was going to use, like, you know, somebody buying more, you know, better equipment to play, you know, tennis or call. But no, that's not the same case. Because mm-hmm. the equipment is only there to supplement your skill. This is what we talk about when it's very fair. That if me, or if I, as a free player, good enough, I can use your free guns, your free car, your free whatever, and still win, that's great. But if it becomes a case where, oh, you didn't buy the Platinum Golf Club that lets you hit 2,000 extra yards, and now every course now has an additional 2,000 yards to hit, you can't compete at that level. Yeah, that's the reason why in my game, Neon Continuum, I have focused on the cards being about strategy and not Mm -hmm. about how many you own or whatnot. Now, of course, the more that you do own, the more strategies that the more strategy potentials that open up to you kind Mm -hmm. of thing. But if you have all the strategy potentials, aka you have all the cards kind of thing, and you're not good at strategy you're not going to do well. Matter of fact, you may do worse than when you had limited strategies because there was a starter deck or whatever that was already better than what you what you built kind mm-hmm. of thing with all the cards kind of thing. And, you know, the thing is, is, you know, it was strategy first and then, you know, it's, it's you know, you, you get more strategy, you know, you get more cards and everything free over time. And that opens up more strategy to you, or you can, you know, and you can pay money on top of that to get even more unlocked, you know? Yeah. But again, it's, again, it's very hard to get that through and keep at that level for a lot of these games. Because as we said earlier, the consumer value, I know there's been talks and studies about this. The consumer expectations or the consumer's thoughts on the value of something can be vastly different than what you as a developer thought. You may think that something is really great or not so great, but when your expert players dig into it, they can figure things out that you may not have realized. That, yeah, that's a secondary market. Yeah, and then that secondary market can come back to hurt your primary market. Because yeah. if everyone, if all your top players say that card A is the best card in the game, don't get anything else, guess what? People aren't going to be buying anything if it's not for that one card. Or that, that one character in a banner. Yeah, and I've seen Magic the Gathering cards that go like that, that are common. Mm-hmm. And the thing is, is that you cannot, like I said before, you cannot plan for the secondary market. You know, because if you but could, you have to factor it, you know, it in. It has to be part of your thought process. Yeah, and you know, part of the thing that you need to, you know, try to do is not have um, bloat uh, or uh, what, what's the word for it when your stats keep on getting higher? Uh, scaling. Yes, that, uh, scaling bloat. You mm-hmm. you want to avoid scaling bloat to the most ability you have, and that comes down to your ability to design the game, your ability to continue to design the game, and the initial design itself. Because mm-hmm. depending on how you design the initial kind of thing, you may have to have designer, you know, you may have to have scope, power creep, you know, mm-hmm. because of the way you did the initial design. But you want to try to do an initial design that 
does not have power creep. And that's the reason why in my game, you know, we have essentially a rock, paper, scissors, you know, system to where our numbers are, you know, now and always will be 139. Mm -hmm. And our, you know, we'll have three different colors for them, you know, blue, red, and yellow. And yellow is less than, you know, you know, blue is greater than and yellow is equal to. So that when, no matter when you, what way you combo these stats kind of thing, there are always nine numbers that will beat every card because there is always one that's equal and eight that are higher or lower. And there will never be any power creep there forever because it is designed in that way kind of thing. Now then, you know, a nine a nine blue that's greater than can beat eight cards, you know, where a one blue can beat zero, but that's that's mm-hmm. not that's gonna just be a power difference, not power creep. Yeah. And it's gonna be that way throughout the entire game, you know, no matter how far we get in. Mm-hmm. But you know, when you have power creep, then you're 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 instantly making the next set better. And at that point, you know, that is saying that if the players do not instantly buy those cards when they first come out, then they're instantly outgunned. Mm -hmm. And again, this is why these systems have to be thought about as early in your development as possible. Because you need... And I think this is another big point, and again, where I think we should probably end up wrap things up. We're going to try to keep things on a some of a fits schedule here. That you need to future proof your design in this aspect. You need to be thinking about how is somebody going to be playing my game six months, a year, three years down the line. And part of the issue that we see for games that aren't as ethical or aren't as fair is that it becomes harder and harder to compete because every new card every new character every new feature that you add in is another source of monetization for you and it's another source of problems and unfairness for the consumer Mm -hmm. and if you don't plan ahead like this it's very easy for developers just to get stuck in this rut and i see this with a lot of mobile games where all the content that they develop is just, you know, forced through their monetization model. Nothing is really added in terms of quality of life, in terms of new stuff for free players. It's just all about the banner, all about the microtransactions. And for the people who are paying, they're going to keep paying. For everyone else, they're going to be getting frustrated and stop. And my final... And then the people that are paying... Mm -hmm will no longer have anybody to play with, and they'll quit. That's yeah. the thing about a multiplayer game. If you have a multiplayer game, and there's nobody to play against, then they quit. Yeah. Like, in Marvel Strike Force, one of the systems that I despised about this game is that when they introduce a new set of characters, it is literally not possible for a free player to get those characters. Because what they do is that they set certain characters up that you need other characters unlocked when you reach a certain rank to get them. And in the span of time between when you can start getting them and when they're released, it is literally not possible for somebody playing the game for free to get them. And that is just pay to win right then and there. Oh yeah, absolutely. And again, we can certainly go around circles and... I'm sure there are more parts about this that we can discuss. If anyone has suggestions for a another topic or a part two for this, let us know in the comments below. But again, if we're trying to keep this under a fair amount of time, I can rant for another 45 minutes to an hour easily. But I think I'll stop here. So what are your final thoughts, Shark? Um, ethical and, you know, is, I mean, it's, it's, it's both clear and unclear at the same time. It it's safe way free. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, you need to to do your best 
to you know figure out things and i mean you need to you know see what you can see for the second market but you can't really plan for the second market you can you can prepare you cannot plan you know mm -hmm. you can set out the dishes and plates out the dinner kind of thing but you cannot determine whether you know genghis khan shows up or or somebody normal shows up that <laughs> or is short <laughs> yeah you know you can't control who shows up and what they'll do when they get there all you can do is set the plates in the dinnerware you know mm -hmm. and what happens after that is up to the people you know so all you can do second market wise is prepare yeah. can't can't actually plan it yeah and again i as i said for developers watching this right now who are struggling with this idea of what to do with their game just again think about what it's like to play your game without spending any money is mm -hmm. it easy to do it can somebody play your game for free and compete and make progress at relative uh, space or sorry relative pace is it annoying to play your game is it frustrating does somebody feel like they're being forced to spend money in your game if the answer is yes to that then you need to take a hard look at your design your monetization and as i've said what we've spent almost 90 minutes talking about is this idea that if I can play your game, <laughs> yeah, the more availability in your game, or the more that I can experience your game without spending money, is going to ultimately make the game better. But at the end of the day, there still needs to be money coming in. If there mm -hmm. isn't money coming in, then it, it basically comes down to this. At the end of the day, somebody is going to be in trouble. Is it going to be the consumer who's spending a lot of money on your game? Or is it going to be the developer who's not earning enough money and it's going to go under? And what yeah. you need to do is you have to balance this. And balancing requires looking at all aspects of your game. From how somebody plays it to where the monetization options are available. As I said earlier... If you want to have a 0.00005% chance to get a five-star character, but people can pull, you know, a hundred times a week, that may be considered very fair for you. If you have a 80% chance to pull a five-star character, but it takes six months of grinding to get those resources, that is probably not going to work for a lot of people. Mm-hmm. But ultimately, it depends, I think, is what we're trying to get at. Ask a lawyer. But seriously, you're going to probably need to ask a lawyer, especially if you start doing currency exchanges. Yeah. And probably a few government bodies as well with that. <laughs> yeah. But let us wrap things up here, because again, this is a topic that can certainly get very wordy. So, as always, thank you so much for for watching this whether you're enjoying it live or recorded if you want to follow us you'll find links to all of our stuff in our respective descriptions and if you want to talk to us on twitter i am on there as gw bicer i'm on there as nexus games inc1 mm -hmm. and you'll find links to both of our twitters both of our discords as well as both of our YouTube channels, because you're on one of them, but you're not on the other. You know, mm -hmm. go subscribe to both, lick the smash button on both, and, uh, you know, ring the bell so that uh, you, you can actually find out, find out when there's a, you know, or maybe thin out when, when there's a, you know, a stream live. Yeah. In, in my case, you know, but like the, there, uh, what else are we missing? The Discord. We, we, Discords are in the description. Mm -hmm. uh, your dev streams. Oh, yeah. We, we have dev streams on uh, every Friday. And on my channel. And on Josh's channel, you have what? Nightly streams, developer interviews. And if you're interested in my books on design, you'll find links to them in the descriptions of every video and stream. 
Mm -hmm. But I think with that, that, I think we're done. Yeah. So we will be back next Sunday around 4, 4, 30 for our next show. And if you'd like to catch our indie game review show, that's Thursdays starting at 3, 3, 30 on uh, ET on our respective channels. And uh, we're always looking for developers to submit their games to come so we can check them out for that mm -hmm. show. All right. So with that said, thank you everybody for watching. Tune in next time for another discussion on game design and game development here on Game Wisdom, where we're some of the art and science of games. Have a great rest of your Sunday, and take care.